The path toward a leadership position in medicine isn't always easy for women, but it's important to find or create growth experiences and meaningful connections wherever you can in your journey. Always be a sponge. Always be learning from the people around you. Everyone here has comes from different experiences, has different backgrounds, even just as medical students. That's Joanna Bisgrove, MD. In part one of this episode of Moving Medicine, a podcast from the American Medical Association, Dr. Bisgrove joins a panel of women leaders who share their unique challenges and experiences regarding their pathway to leadership in medicine. I'm your host, Todd Unger, Chief Experience Officer at the American Medical Association. Here's part one of the panel discussion. One of the first questions that I have for you is just to ask you all about the challenges that you've had as a woman in medicine and what you've done to overcome these challenges. Um, so uh, you can go ahead, Dr. Visco. <laughs> okay. Um, so my original challenge when I was young was not being female, it was being hard of hearing. And so from a really young age, um, and from that perspective, a lot of you probably know about the IDEA Act. I am pre-IDEA Act, and so what, but what I was lucky in the sense, uh, my father is, he is a professor emeritus and retired attending at Rush Medical College, and my mother was a lawyer. So I had two very educated uh, parents, and, the, and I also had um, kind of a sort of a women in leaders, a, a women empowerment role in my family. So my mother was a lawyer, like I said, she was one of three women in her law school class at Northwestern. And then even more important as far as my heritage, my grandmother was one of three women in her pharmacy school class here in Chicago. And this was like the pair picture. She passed away not that long ago, about six years ago uh, at the age of 99, but her picture was from the 1920s or 30s. And yeah, there were three women in that pharmacy school class. And so that was what I grew up with in terms of leadership role and so for me the, the the women part was always a little more clear-cut but having to advocate for my needs as a hard of hearing individual is always really challenging and having my parents help me through that um, and building those advocacy skills young kind of helped power me through um, med school when I started running into some of the, the gender biases um, I started as an engineer engineering major in undergrad at Cornell and they all kind of looked at like everyone in the every guy in the classroom knew what they all knew where the, where the women sat and that was really annoying because like every like oh yeah you sit in this seat and i'm like what um that was because there were so few of us and we would get comments about yeah being the cute engineers and it's like really inappropriate stuff um and then so on and so forth through medical school so it's just like having the hearing stuff, that kind of helped me overcome the challenges from the women's standpoint because I kind of already had it built in um, and kind of powered me from, from there. Um, but learning those skills early on really helped, at least for me. Yeah, thank you. Um, so actually being a woman, when I was in medical school, we had about a quarter of our class were women. So it wasn't quite being as much of a pioneer. And we actually had a great relationship with other women who were mentors uh, who were practicing physicians. So that was, that was very helpful for us. Um, so we had role models in that because actually going back to some role model issues like Joanna was saying, from a woman in medicine perspective, there really, that was very rare. I mean, the only person that I knew who was a woman in medicine was the physician who took care of us as a school physical. That was it, you know, that person. Um, and she was a really lovely person, but she wasn't someone necessarily that you could look to as a, um, you know, a model, role model for that role. Um, but on the other hand, talking about some other women, my mother was, um, she actually got her EDD, I and mean, that was very early when women weren't necessarily going for doctoral degrees. So she actually went to, you know, all through the you know, undergraduate and then the master's in education and then subsequently the doctoral degree. So she was always a strong woman and, and kind of inculcated in me that you could do what you wanted to be able to do as long as you worked hard for it, um, but you had to do it in a way that um, 
engage other people in the conversation, not overbearing, but simply being part of the conversation, making sure that kind of you were at the table when discussions took place. Um, other, other challenges were actually kind of a little bit even later in the career, where for example, I was married, I still am fortunately, but I mean at the time that was a situation where the person making up the schedule for the emergency department said, oh, well, I said, where are my shifts? I thought I should get this number. Oh, well, you don't really need that number because you're, you're a spouse. I'm like, mm, yes, I do. And we made sure that it happened, but you had to speak up, otherwise it wouldn't go forward. I was actually in the very first class of the Medical College of Ohio uh, at Toledo in the Sky. That was the name of it then. I am very fortunate after 40 plus years in private practice with eight physicians that I was able to go back to that very same medical school and work with the medical students. My motto has been since I've been there, and I use an eyeball, the non-evil eye. Keep your eye on the patient, not on the computer screen. So when we talk about growing into medicine, um, my everything, my mentor, my inspiration was my mother. My mother, though, was a nurse. My mother so admired physicians. She didn't tell me about any female physicians because she didn't know any. But she so admired them, that's what I wanted to be, just because of that. She didn't tell me exactly she wanted to, me to be a doctor, because at the University of Oregon then, of 100 medical students, there would be one female, and she wore orcs, orthopedic Oxfords. That wasn't the image I projected for myself in my white coat with my daring red stethoscope. So uh, I went into other things first, looking at uh, I, I had my mother, one sister was an attorney, another was a nurse, one was a home ed, ec teacher. So I started off in medical technology to pay some money back for, for schooling, although we didn't have the debt like you have. It was very, very, very different. And um, so, but following her lead of her caring for patients was really what drove me. Uh, I think one of the things when you're thinking about going down a, a career path that is very challenging, that you first must have the dream. And so we talk about all the time, people say, what what was your dream, or when did you start thinking you wanted to be a physician? I, I really don't know. I do remember it transported me to where I was sitting in a chair waiting to be interviewed for medical school, and it went up, there were 13 stairs going up to the interview room, and I could hear this person saying, oh, you want to know why I wanted to become a doctor? I want to be just like Ben, whatever, there was a neurosurgeon who had a TV show. And I thought, he's saying that to the neurocommunity? I'm, I'm home free. I could say anything I wanted. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so it was um, because she was so proud of being in the medical profession and it wasn't, um, it's oh, how hard it's going to be, but she didn't say, I want you to be a doctor. I knew what she really wanted was someday she would be able to say, my daughter, the doctor. And it happened, I flew her out here from the West Coast, and she was able to say that. That's what made it all worthwhile. I will mention one challenge, because I remember this very clearly, and what I did was, fortunately, I was able to turn it into a joke, and I laughed aloud at the attending, which probably wasn't appropriate. Uh, but I was so excited. We were starting our uh, clinical clerkships, and I was on OB. I'd never even seen a baby being born. And so he took us around and showed us to the rooms and where we'd be staying, and he said to the three, uh, interns, men, and then he looked at me, he said, oh, you can sleep here, look how nice this is, you got a color TV, da, 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 and he goes, oh, you. I, it was really an afterthought, and he said, hmm, where can you sleep? I said, I can sleep just about anywhere if I'm really tired. He goes, oh, there is a rollaway bed back in the shower in the nurse's lounge, and so you can sleep there. And so I actually managed to say, I remember it so clearly, well, you know, that'll be just great because I'm not going to have to get out of bed in the morning to take my shower. And I wasn't truly like that. I'd had 12 years of the nuns, you know, with the ruler. And uh, so I did truly say that, and I remember that. But after that, what seemed to me to make the biggest difference was that if I could turn what seemed to be a negative into a positive and kept doing that and pretending the other didn't exist. That isn't always a good way to live, but it worked for me. And so there were so few women, it was easy to be first in everything. You just had to volunteer a little bit more. And they go, well, look at that. Dr. Woodson, she's this and this and that. So that, that kind of encouraged me to be first. But there probably were things said, and I've heard later there were, about uh, that might not have been appropriate. I, I didn't hear them or I ignored them. And I didn't care. 
I got to say. Uh, my mother got to say, my daughter, the doctor. That was enough for me. Things have changed now. And I know as we've moved up higher and higher uh, in uh, medical society that you have many more challenges. So I hope some of the other things we have to say uh, will help you. Mainly I found that if you just set your sights on being the best you could be, the best you could be, whether male or female, eventually they're going to have to accept us, right? We still have a little work to do, but I, I, I think that philosophy works. You took care of the nation. It's time for the nation to take care of you. The AMA stood by America's physicians and patients during the pandemic, and we're not stopping there. We're fixing prior authorization, leading the charge on Medicare payment reform, supporting telehealth, fighting scope creep, and reducing physician burnout. It's time to rebuild, and the AMA is ready. To learn more about the AMA Recovery Plan for America's Physicians, go to ama-assn.org slash time to rebuild. So uh, that kind of actually brings us to our next question. Um, what are some ways that women can be leaders in their specialties? So um, Dr. Hine, do you want to take this one first? Sure. So in terms of what like Donna had said, terms of being the best you can be and, and speaking up when you're interested, I mean, there are different avenues. So for example, um, in the specialty society or in the state medical society or in the AMA, there are always opportunities. And if you speak up and express interest and show that you're really willing and interested to work and to be a real good contributor, then you will be asked to continue to do different things. So it's really important to have your message, to show your enthusiasm, and to connect with others to show that you're genuinely interested in actually having a part in part in the play, having a part in what goes on. Um, I think that there, if you look around, you can always see that there are opportunities. If you have a passion, if there's a particular issue that you want to, on what you want to advocate. There's almost always going to be an opportunity, whether it be a resolution, whether it be a committee, or any other work group. You're going to find that because your antenna will be up, and you'll be able to really fit in and make that truly a dedicated input on your part. And that will shine. That will help you both as an individual in terms of your growth, your connections with others and relationships that you form, as well as just being able to say that you know you have made that contribution it'll make you feel more more worthy in terms of just the contribution is really helpful but we all grow as individuals and we learn from each other and other people will look at you and say hmm that's this is really great what you're doing and they will want to emulate you so you'll be in that situation where people will look at you as a role model and that will inspire others when I look at so many of you involved in organized medicine, and I try to say to those, there aren't very many students at the University of Toledo College of Medicine who aren't members of the AMA. And so what I say to those who aren't or who, who don't have the time or have other things they're interested in, find something else that is your passion uh, and invest yourself in that. But always, especially when you get out into practice, but you need to start in medical school, stay involved in organized medicine. As more and more physicians become employed, and I, want, I wish I could take away some of that fear of not feeling that you had to have a mean uncle taking care of you, telling you how long you had with the patient, telling you how long you could go on vacation. If you could find the way to help others and yourself, uh, some friendly banker who's going to loan you money and you're going into practice <laughs> together and have some independence. And if you can't do that, then you need to belong either to a specialty society or, and hopefully also the AMA, uh, because as Marilyn said, there are always opportunities here. What happens sometimes is that you get so good at, oh, I think if I volunteer for that, that's going to be, and it often is, a step to doing more. And people to see your abilities and your enthusiasm and your passion for things, uh, and then they accept you as a physician. It doesn't matter what the gender, ethnicity, or what have you. So I, I think those are things to, to really remember that organized medicine, though, and every six months, then you come back and you see friends. They're not just regular friends like you grew up with in the neighborhood. These are friends who share similar passions in the profession that is like none other. What other profession do you know that allows you to be in someone's personal space like you have? 
to share with you and maybe none others what their hopes and dreams are and get to know uh, what makes them tick and follow them along uh, with the continuity of caring. There's no career like it, and that's why when you come to other things, perseverance, I, I would say, uh, you have the dream, and then you have to persevere. And perseverance is doing something that may be difficult, uh, but you're gonna continue to do it uh, until you reach that goal, no matter how long it takes. I think that there's so much um, importance put on testing these days I think they're stealing away some good years of your lives but when I see you here when I see you here among your friends with the laughter and the sense of accomplishment when you present a resolution that may change the policy of American medicine and I'm looking at one right now uh, <laughs> making the steps up the ladder that excitement what could be like it so but you can't make it all worry and doom and gloom Worry, spending the time, steals your time, it steals your enthusiasm, and it saps your energy to do the studying you have to do, but have some fun that you must have. Everyone here in this room has already fulfilled the first rule of leadership, show up. That is huge. You can't be involved in leadership if you're not there. Um, if, you're at the tab if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. Those are <laughs> basics. You guys have learned that. Good job. You're on your way. Your leaders are ready. Um, second thing I always, I've started to tell people on a regular basis, at least what I've learned, always be a sponge. Always be learning from the people around you. Everyone here has comes from different experiences, has different backgrounds, even just as medical students also learn from people who have been in the house for a long time, people who have been in practice, physicians, residents, anyone around you, because it's amazing what you can learn. And amazing not just about policy, but about intera human interaction and about strategy. The third thing is also in that, in learning policy and learning resolution writing and learning how to testify and all of that, also learn what you're good at. Um, because in, in that, you get further at, you want to work on things you're not great at, but in terms of furthering yourself, if there's something you're naturally good at, then hone that skill. One of the things I like to do, as both as having my undergrad degree be uh, being in engineering, and I'm pretty sure it's from coming from a large Jewish family, is I like to connect things. I like to problem solve. I like to take, okay, we've got this, let's connect it to this. And how that's helped me from a sort of political standpoint is more been in my own organization. It did mention up there, I, was on, I just came off the board of SSM Healthcare, a Catholic organization, an integrated delivery network, but Catholic organization um, last, this past January. Um, I was the only Jew on the board. I was the only non-Christian on the board, period. But I frequently pointed out at different viewpoints um, I came off the board not entirely voluntarily, um, but <laughs> but at the same time, our board is a little more, it's, it's more formal than functional. The real power lays on the board subcommittee, particularly the joint finance committee, which I'm still on. And um, in our organization, we have a lot of physician leadership, but majority of them are really involved in the organization. We only have a few that are on the outside uh, that do advocacy, and I've been completely thing. We need more people in advocacy. But being one of the few people has had its advantages because I know what's going on here. I know what's going on in the, the public realm. And I've been able to say, hey, this is coming down the pike. Because I'm on joint finance because I know public policy, because I know what's going on in the government, and because I can help inform our strategy. And so I bring things, and without revealing anything, because I bring things in, there was a situation recently where I kept saying, this is coming. And they are like, really? Yeah, no way. And then this big opportunity that we can, government opportunity that our organ that our entire system, because SSM isn't just Wisconsin, it's multiple states. But this big opportunity that we could be involved with that I said was coming suddenly came and they're like, oh my goodness, I'm on the phone with the president of our region, who's like our top dog. We're talking about this. And I said, this is why. This is why we need to be involved. This is why we need more people. And he said to me, he said, those are pretty big promises you're making there. 
And I just turned right back around and said, well, I delivered, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, building, like, honing those skills and building those connections, but really doing what you're good at, leads me to my last thing. Always be willing to volunteer, not just for leadership, but for anything, for helping people build capital. Because you've got people trusting you, you've, you help people out, you never know when that's going to come back to help you. And that's important in organized medicine, that's going to be important in your organizations. Um, if, you're, if, you're always, if you always try to be the one that's involved, that's engaged, that's helpful, that only makes people like you and respect you. you, like you do it. And so when that time comes around when you need help, they're a lot more willing to stand up with, stand up for you just as you stood up for them. That was part one of our panel discussion on women leaders in medicine. I'm Todd Unger, and this is Moving Medicine, a podcast by the American Medical Association. You can discover more great audio content from the AMA by visiting ama-assn.org slash Alexa. Enable our Morning Rounds Alexa skill to get news updates delivered to your Alexa-enabled device every weekday. You can also subscribe to Moving Medicine and other great AMA podcasts on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and Spotify, or visit ama-assn.org slash podcasts. Thank you for listening.